and the, the original uh, purpose of this, in a sense, was to discover a mechanism that might lend itself to the development of a drug. There is no such thing. Uh, in fact, it's really undercut my notion and the notion of a lot of people in pharmacology uh, that we tend to want to find a specific mechanism and then treat it in some way to stop the disease. That's not the way to do it, uh, because it turns out, uh, as you can see here in part, and with other research to nutrition works by many nutrition, nutrients working together uh, and working by multiple mechanisms, if you will, which we call biological plausibility. Uh, and that is really what nutrition is about. This is the distinction, simply put. This is the this distinction between trying to control disease, even reverse it and treat it, versus uh, uh, use of nutrition to do it, versus the use of drugs. Nutrition is far, far better. That's that's nature. That's the way it works. Nutri other nutrients do the same thing, and they operate not just on this kind of cancer or, or other kinds of cancers, but a whole variety of different kinds of diseases. It's one just one big cloud of effect, almost if I can put it that way, of mechanisms and nutrients working together and so, in a marvelous way to uh, affect a lot of results that turn out to be the same. Uh, so I'm just showing here a little scheme of, of what is involved here. This is a sort of my little biochemical schematic, uh, of what I just said. Uh, the, this is, these are two cells, right? And uh, the carcinogen comes into the cell and eventually it gets metabolized and binds to DNA and then it can be repaired and, and then it comes down and comes into a new cell as the cell divides. And anyhow, all these little stars are just little symbols indicating the 10 mechanisms that we discovered. These four in the first cell, the four in the, in the sort of daughter cell, they all increase cancer because they're in, they increase in activity and they increase cancer. Here's the two that, in fact, uh, the, the high protein diet actually blocked this. This is good. I mean, our body just normally wants to repair this kind of stuff and it goes on you know, to a great, uh, good pace all of our lives. But the high protein diet actually decreased this. And then, and then daughter cells, when they come along, um, they actually uh, block the formation of another immune cell that's used to actually kill this, this, this what we call it natural killer cells. Later, this is called T cells in modern day. But in any case, uh, the high protein diet, you can imagine, 10 things it's choosing to do. And I'm sure there'd be far, far more if we just had time for one look at them. What, what it showed me was that the high protein diet is doing a lot of mischief according to a lot of different mechanisms. So that's the way that I see nutrition working. It's not one nutrient we're doing one thing at a time, you know, affecting one particular disease that you can see short-term effects sometimes with that approach, but in terms of long-term health, that is not the way to do it. It's a source of immense confusion, as I mentioned before. Now, I want to show you another sort of angle on this uh, perspective, you know, of nutrition being uh, sort of uh, very effective in terms of controlling more than one disease. I'm going to show you here uh, a, a series of plots, graphs, if you will, that were published during the last, uh, I think it's let's say since 1959, wherever that is, just the time I was a graduate student, I guess. These are these are studies by other researchers showing something really interesting. And I, I just went back and collected this information here maybe four or five years ago uh, to see what this looks like. Basically, here's a case with kidney cancer. Uh, uh, on, on, on the uh, y-axis, an amount of animal protein consumed. Uh, this is, as I say, another research had nothing to do with this. And this is a, a, a list of all countries, I mean, a, a group of countries on this chart. I drew the line through there, regression line, using a certain algorithm that was permissible. And you can see that the, there's almost a straight line relationship. The higher the animal protein intake, the higher the kidney cancer rates. That's really impressive. And I want to say, too, that'll never be shown to be the reverse. Uh, I mean, there's too much data here to imagine something being reversed. So more protein, more kidney cancer. Um, and here's another one. Here's one more. This was done in 1959 on heart disease. This, again, is a bunch of, uh, of countries, if you will. Uh, the higher the protein intake here on the x-axis, the higher the heart disease rates. That's equivalent to uh, the discovery that... Uh, uh, higher protein, the higher cholesterol levels was associated with the protein as well. This is kidney, uh, this is uh, animal protein. So then we go to another. This was done in the 1980s 
if you will, this is prostate cancer and non-fat milk. Look at that is really impressive. Again, a straight line relationship almost coming down to this XY origin, if you will. Higher consumption of non-fat milk, more prostate cancer. And there's been quite a lot of research done on that now. Uh, and people tend to want to ignore it. Uh, but non-fat milk, by the way, doesn't have fat for one thing, obviously. It doesn't really have any sugar. And the only other thing that's left for pro for energy is protein. So I regard this as, a, as an indication of animal protein effect. Higher animal protein consumption, more prostate cancer. Again, that is so impressive. You see lines like that with a, a wide range of data for countries around the world. <laughs> that means something. Uh, here's one for breast cancer deaths. Uh, this is a friend of mine from Canada who actually was measuring at that time, and he didn't think about the animal protein question at that time, but uh, he was uh, distinguishing different things about the diet with respect to uh, breast cancer cases. He was uh, looking, for example, saturated fat was a primary animal food. In fact, the correlation between saturated fat and animal protein is almost perfect. So this is another indication that rather than saturated fat being responsible for this, it's really animal protein. Here's the United States up here near the top. Again, straight right relationship to go right down to the origin. And I keep pointing out this idea of this, these lines going down through the origin. What they suggest in theory, more than theory, actually, what they strongly suggest is as soon as we eat any animal protein uh, and or animal protein-based diets, uh, as animal protein goes up, plant protein, protein goes down. Of course, I said that before. But as soon as we start consuming that kind of diet, typical of the American diet, we start to get these diseases. I don't see how that isn't so impressive that it should be made in front pages of the newspaper. These are, as I say, studies by, done by others. Here's one uh, a little bit uh, different in this case. Uh, this is cholesterol intake on the y-axis and heart disease on the bottom axis. But this is, should, again, shows the same thing. The amount of cholesterol we consume is a represent, representative of the amount of animal protein we consume. In fact, it's been known that the amount of cholesterol we consume does not necessarily have much to do with the amount of cholesterol in the blood. There's lots more going on than that. So what it shows is increase in cholesterol intake, or let's say protein, uh, we get more heart disease. Again, a really straight line relationship. And that was done, I forget the year that was. Uh, here's one from colon cancer. Look at this. This is uh, meat intake on the x-axis, y on the y-axis is colon cancer. So the higher the intake of animal protein, again, animal-based diet has so it's all of these. Uterine cancer, urine cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, three cancers of the reproductive tract. And what you can see here is the same thing again. So here we have all these, all these charts that were done before. And each of these researchers, and I knew some of them, uh, never took it, never took a serious consideration of the fact that this was really animal protein. They called it maybe non-fat milk, or they called it meat, or what it was cholesterol. But what we see in all of these. Uh, is basically the same information, irrefutable. No one will ever come along and research and ever show the opposite. This is far too much data for that to be something different. And so um, I thought that was really quite impressive. I call those things that that's being measured by other means, cholesterol, which is only in meat, meat itself, total fat, low fat milk, saturated fat. Uh, those are all representations of animal protein in, uh, uh, intake. Uh, from animal protein surrogates. Uh, now, here's what I just want to throw in here by one of the previous researchers who uh, actually was looking at the relationship between unsaturated fat, I, I changed it here to pro plant protein, but um, he, he looked at the relationship between unsaturated fat and breast cancer and found no relationship. Unsaturated fat is typically present in plants. So when you when you see, they consume more plants, you don't see any relationship like you do with animal food. It's so striking. It is so striking. Now I want to move to a, a, another thought. And first off, is, is the animal protein effect itself it, it, when it's consumed with other foods, of course, they all tend to work together. And even one nutrient, like animal protein, for example, has infinite numbers of mechanisms by which it works in the form of a cloud, like uh, together with the other nutrients, they're all doing the same thing. So we had that, we had these data, data I just showed you, uh, human studies showing the relationship. And uh, now let's take this forward uh, and, and, and more recent times. Uh, in this particular case, in the food and dietary guidelines that were developed in about 2000, 
We develop data guidelines every five years, revise them, look over again. A group of scientists get together and work on any up, update information they might like to have. But it's really run by the United States Department of Agriculture, who is beholden to the livestock industry, by the way, coupled with the Department of Health and Human Services, which is coupled with the use of pharmaceuticals. So those two uh, cabinets in the president's cabinet, agriculture on one hand, uh, health and human services on the other, uh, basically get together uh, and decide every five years what should be the guide guidelines for American for the public information. I want to show you here something in, in 2002. I know this very well, quite personally, quite frankly. Um, and so what I want to show you here to make my point is that the dietary protein consumed in the United States as a percent of calories, you can see here, it's, I've broken it down in this way to show you. First off, this was long ago determined that five to six percent of total calories was um, was pro as a minimum amount of protein needed. I mean, protein is the essential nutrient. Make no mistake about it. We need it. No question about that. But only five to six percent of calories is all we. Uh, that's a minimum requirement. They say, if you will. Uh, we recommend, though, around 9, 10% or so. That's a recommended daily allowance, and that's enough for enough protein for everyone, right? But in reality, here's what we do. By the way, these dietary recommendations were started in 1943, so a, we've had a long time working on this, this kind of thing. So what with the fact that only 9 to 10% of the protein being recommended on a daily basis, uh, unfortunately, the population, the public didn't go along with that all that well. We like our meat and eggs and milk and so forth. And so we were eating protein within this black range. And this is the range of protein intake for the American population. All of it basically in excess of what we really needed. 75% to 80% of that protein is animal-based. So we're basically uh, consuming protein at a level far greater than we need, number one, and 75 to 80% is animal-based. That's quite striking. So we're way out of whack in, in a sense. Uh, now, I want to compare the, this range here of normal intake, if you will, uh, versus um, the little chart, this little uh, chart up in the upper left-hand corner, corner the, just a capture of the previous slides I showed you. Uh, those increases in, in uh, disease occurred in protein intake ranges right during this period here. In other words, those, those charts, those lines start right here uh, when we can get all the protein we need from plants. We start an adding animal food and here come our diseases. Overlaying what we normally do. So we do this, a lot of us are up, up, up in this territory, we get more heart disease, cancer and all the rest. And so they, this, 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 that's, I'm just overlaying that with this. Let me show you the real punch line here. Oh, by the way, Hopefully, plant-based diets, by, by the way, provide enough protein. We don't need it more than that. Although plants can have much higher levels, you can go up to 20 maybe or even higher. Uh, but that's no, no, no consequence because that does not increase cholesterol, does not promote cancer. So by using animal food, on the one hand, we get this kind of chart here. Now, in 2002, uh, the, that committee at the time decided to... Um, Established a so-called upper safe level for each nutrient. And so they did it for a variety of nutrients in that report. Um, and uh, so they decided that 35% is upper safe level. In other words, this is nothing more than an ad uh, by the government, let's put it in case, basically under the control of industry, but an ad to consume as much animal protein as you can get. <laughs>